There's this big disconnect that seems to consume your work uh, in The Rational Optimist and uh, more recently you're talking about the greening of the planet Earth, the disconnect between popular perception of where we're headed in terms of our uh, likely prospects for continuing to get to live on Earth, the, the human species, and data that you've looked at. So can you draw some of that out? Yes, it's not just that over the past 50 years, despite predictions of many, many gloomy, doomy scenarios that were going to happen, none of them happened. In fact, human welfare improved dramatically, but so did most of the environmental measures. The air got cleaner, the water got cleaner, forests expanded, wildlife recovered, the amount of farmland needed went down uh, compared with the amount of crop being produced, etc. So not only has the past proved much better than predicted for the last 50 years. But looking at the future, there's every reason to think that we're heading in the right direction uh, and, and that we're actually going to be able to live much more comfortably on the earth and leave much more for nature and have much more wildlife around us in 50 or 100 years than we are today. Because the earth is actually getting greener at the moment. Um, uh, literally, the amount of green vegetation on the planet is increasing. Population growth is falling, uh, so the rate of increase of the population is coming down, so there are, the, that problem is easing, as it were. Uh, technology is still reducing the amount of carbon or the amount of energy we need for each unit of GDP growth. Uh, so there are all sorts of ways in which the future actually is very bright, both environmentally as well as economically. Uh, you make note of a recent IPCC report that I don't know how much you have to read the, between the lines to get to this point, but the point is the faster we can grow our economy or the more we can grow our economy, the faster we can cut emissions. For a lot of people, that makes total sense, but for others, that's a sort of a shocking uh, admission. Well, I think it's surprising that people go on saying that the solution to climate change is to, to deindustrialize or to slow down economic growth when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change itself quite clearly says uh, that it thinks it's likely that innovation, growth and trade will produce higher incomes in one scenario than another, and that scenario is the one in which we're most likely to cut emissions. I mean, they literally have graphs showing this, that the, that the solution in which global warming is not a problem under any assumptions is the one with the richest outcome in terms of GDP per capita by the end of the century. It's the one where we're 16 times as rich as we are today on average in terms of income uh, by 2100. That's the one where global warming stops before it gets anywhere near dangerous. You point to uh, a sort of an event, a case in which somebody had submitted a paper to The Lancet on this issue of maternal mortality. And I, if you don't mind, tell us, uh, tell us that story and what it illustrates. Well, there's a general bias against publishing good news because uh, – partly because it doesn't sell in, in newspaper terms, but also because there's a tendency to think that if you say things are getting better, then funding for that problem will dry up. And there was a good example of this a few years ago where maternal mortality, which had been declining and then stagnated for a number of years, resumed its decline globally. And somebody wanted to publish a paper pointing this out. Uh, and the journal editor came under a lot of pressure from pressure groups to say, don't publish this because... Uh, it will reduce our chances of getting funding to work on maternal mortality. Uh, well, actually, you should be able to fund more of it if you're showing success in the progress against it. But apart from that, it just shows the degree to which there is a tendency to leave the good news out of publication. We publish all the time about the bad news. Whenever we get a hint of bad news, it goes straight into the press or the professional journals. Uh, but good news tends to get left out. I've made a bit of a career about seeking it out and, 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 and showing it the light of day. And this is a this is a broader problem than just uh, medical journals. This is a, a problem of environmental science, of health, of what makes us fat, any number of things. That's absolutely right. That 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 good news is no news as far as publication is concerned, and uh, uh, there are um, you know, the, the the if you were to do a study that concluded that 
no, this species was not under threat from global warming or, or no, there was nothing going badly wrong with, with this habitat, um, you'd struggle to get that published. Whereas if you came to the conclusion that there is a dire and urgent threat to a, to a species or a habitat or something, you would find it much easier to publish that. You point also to when you talk about uh, the climate change models, one of which you tie and say that it would predict a 16-fold growth in our uh, well-being, another one three times uh, of a tripling of our well-being, essentially. But the one that predicts the lower economic growth is the one that is very dirty. That's exactly and the that, truth. That's, that's, yeah. that, that is so striking. And, and that's just based on the assumptions that are built into the models that's that, right. f that feed this uh, data. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I just noticed that the, 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 the low warming model produced high incomes and the high warming model produced low incomes. And since most people assume it's the opposite, um, uh, I think it's worth pointing it out. Now, the assumptions that go into the, the only one of the four scenarios that produce dangerous global warming – the assumptions that go into that are really quite extreme. They assume population growth will accelerate. They assume trade will largely dry up. They assume we will get 50% of our primary energy from coal, which is a huge amount more than, than now uh, by the end of this century. They assume we'll increase coal burning tenfold during the, the, the 21st century. Now, all of this is just possible, but it's extremely unlikely. So my point is that when you hear people say we could see global warming up to four degrees, you should say yes, but only if some really unlikely things happen in terms of global technology and energy supplies, uh, and only if we stay pretty poor. One last thing, uh, e-cigarettes. I'm a, I'm a fan, uh, and uh, you use that to point out that maybe a lot of these concerns about e-cigarettes aren't really about health that maybe they're really just about something else, when you, especially when you consider the relative health effects that are likely. We don't know a lot just yet, but we know enough to say that they're probably much, much safer than cigarettes. Well, if a, if a technology comes along that is probably a thousand times safer than a dangerous technology like the cigarette, uh, and it doesn't require subsidy, um, it's provided by the private sector, it, uh, it, it, people are taking it up voluntarily on a massive scale without any encouragement from government. Uh, what's wrong with that? Uh, what we're talking about here is relative risk, not absolute risk. Of course, they may not be completely harmless compared with doing nothing, electronic cigarettes. But compared with smoking, we know they are very, very much safer. So the crucial thing is to encourage uh, the take-up of a rival technology that shows real promise of actually driving the cigarette to extinction in a way that nicotine patches have failed to do for, for, for many years. Now, is what's driving that impulse of presumably public health officials and politicians to say, well, we just need to get rid of this, I, it, part, of it, part of me says this is just repugnance toward something that looks like smoke coming, at, coming out of somebody's mouth. But also it seems that uh, maybe part of it is well, this isn't a program that we're controlling, this program of this widespread private sector distribution of this technology. I think there's a, there is a definite tendency here for uh, people in the public sector to be very upset at the idea that a solution to the problem of smoking, which they've been trying to solve for many years, is coming from the private sector and not from the public sector. There's, there's, there's an element of that in, in, the, in the disapproval. Um, uh, there's, there are vested interests in nicotine patches and so on, which is partly why the pharmaceutical industry is fighting quite hard against electronic cigarettes behind the scenes. Uh, but, but a lot, and of course, there's also, in, you know, the, the sort of instinctive thing that you see someone enjoying uh, what looks like a cigarette, and you think, oh, we cannot go back to that. That's terrible. We think we've spent many, many years trying to demonize that activity. Um, or to put it rather more bluntly, Puritans are people who, uh, as someone once said, are horrified by the thought that someone, someone somewhere may be enjoying themselves. So.